Hello everyone. Uh, I am Shreyas. And I am Richa. Welcome to our channel, Life of Sai, where we will explore journey of eminent researchers around the globe, and we hope to inspire curiosity and to understand the scope of scientific research. For our first interaction, we have with us Padma Vibhushan, Dr. Raghunath Anand Mashilkar, who has been the recipient of three of the highest civilian honors. Padma Vibhushan, Padma Bhushan, and Padma Shri. He is a prominent Indian scientist who has made significant contributions to advancement of research at the National Chemical Laboratory (NCL) and Council of Scientific and Industrial Research (CSIR). He received his PhD from Institute of Chemical Technology, erstwhile UDCT, in 1969, followed by a postdoctoral fellowship at Salford University, UK. Inspired by the words of Dr. Nayudama. the then director of csir he returned to india where he went on to become the director at ncl in 1989 he played a pivotal role in ncl's collaborations with companies in india and abroad which later translated to a similar feat at csir when he became its director in 1995 and as we already know dr mashilkar fought a 14 month long legal battle to revoke the us patents on turmeric neem and basmati rice which is uh, the traditional knowledge of india he has been the humble recipient of awards and honors both in the homeland and abroad the remarkable of which are being the third indian engineer to be elected as the fellow of royal society and first indian to be elected at the national academy of inventors in the us he continues to advise leading industries in india and also continues to inspire the young minds like ours dr mashilkar we are honored to have a conversation with you today uh, and we would like to know about your life as a scientist as a leader and as a mentor to us the budding researchers welcome thank you thank you very much in fact i am honored to talk to you you are uh, the future of india all right so it's wonderful to engage with the future of india thank you sir thank you, sir so starting with uh, your own uh, starting of the research uh, career so we are curious to know when did you decide to take research as uh, your profession or to be a scientist yeah that's a very interesting question and maybe you'll be surprised with the answer that was in school uh, and i'll explain to you how it happens you know once in a while there is what uh, we call as a life changing experience uh, that you have and that i had in my school but there is a bit of a background to it uh, i uh, went to a municipal school uh, when i began the journey of my life uh, i studied in marathi and uh, i want to tell the audience that it did not make any difference studying in municipal school or studying in marathi and then uh, i went to union high school which was uh, for my secondary education and uh, i was uh, very lucky i would say that i had some of the best teachers that i met in my life in that school uh, it was a poor school because uh, what happened was uh, that my widowed mother uh, who had moved from marshal to mumbai uh, in search of a job Uh, and uh, i remember from that municipal school when uh, i was in the 7th standard i got some 84 percent mark i stood first etc uh, but still to get into a good school became difficult because the 21 rupees that she needed she could not uh, get hold of very quickly so all the good admissions in good schools were closed and we went to a poor school that was union high school uh, where uh, the students from the lower strata of the society used to come but that poor school had a rich teacher or rich teachers you know i was very lucky and one of them was principal bhave uh, he taught us science by the way and science means everything physics chemistry biology etc etc uh, and uh, uh, what he believed in was always uh, uh, experimenting you know we talk about innovation in education education in innovation but he started doing it at that time and one of the things he believed very strongly in was that we must uh, not just learn by rote but learn 
by observing, learn by seeing. Okay, so he would take us, for example, the soap making factory of Hindustan lever in Sivli. He just didn't teach us the equations on how to make soap and uh, was not stuck on the blackboard uh, with, with uh, uh, you know, but wanted us to see real life, like the Vimco factory, um, which made uh, uh, sort of matchboxes. You know, I remember uh, sort of he's taking us there. So he always wanted us to see something and learn from it. So I remember one day he took us out into the open. The sun was shining and he had a convex lens in his hand. And he wanted to show us how to find a focal length. And there was a piece of paper which he moved up and down. And then when there was the brightest spot, he said, uh, this is the focal length. And then he hid it for some time and the paper burnt. When the paper burned, for some reason, he turned to me and said, uh, uh, like this, uh, Mushenka, if you focus, you can achieve anything in life. Now, that did two things for me. I said, science is so fantastic. Why uh, uh, don't I become a scientist? That one experiment, uh, you know, was uh, the decision-making point for me. The second was, the great lesson in life was you focus and you can achieve anything. That's why I always tell young people like you that you can do uh, anything but not everything. So focus, 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 and focus. All right. So those two lessons I got. So that is how I went into science. Then your question is, how did I get into scientific research? Uh, you will be uh, surprised. Today we talk about solar energy. Mm -hmm. Right. We talk about renewable energy. Hardly anybody talked about renewable energy at that time. Okay. But then that one experiment told me that I don't have to use a matchstick to burn a paper. Why waste it? I can use sun's energy to burn a paper. That is nothing but uh, renewable energy. And today we are all gaga or. So, how do you do that? And then the next question was that, uh, that is fine, burning paper is fine, but how do you use it on a larger scale? And that is where what he showed to us, how to make a soap. So we had seen the chemistry in the, in the, in the room uh, with a flask, it poured uh, uh, all the ingredients and created a soapy material. That is how it was made, he said. But then when I saw the factory from end to end, you know, how do you mix the different ingredients in different tanks, mix it and the, the, that and the other, and then the drying process. And finally, uh, the entire assembly line where what you get uh, in your hand, uh, uh, you know, is made. So I said, how do you move from this idea to making final impact? Okay. And as a result of that, experimentation, uh, invention, uh, creativity, on doing different things, etc. They were born, I would say, in that poor school, as far as I'm concerned. So my decision to get into research, in a way, although formally I did it after my became age, uh, the trigger was when I was uh, that young. And that is the importance of uh, teachers, by the way. The teachers um, sort of stimulate you, they inspire you. And that inspiration came at an early age. I was very lucky. That's great to know. I mean, I would say that uh, the experiment that you did when you ignited the paper by focusing the lens, at that time, you also got, uh, your mind also got ignited with the, uh, with the flame to do a research, with the zest to pursue the research. So once you had this idea and you actually went for studying and uh, towards PhD, uh, how was the environment around you, like your friends or your family? Uh, how were they uh, when you had this, uh, this research as your choice for career? Well, I think uh, one has to uh, go back into my uh, educational background. As uh, you know, I studied in Union High School, did my SSC, Secondary School Certificate Exam. And then uh, I got admission in Jahin College, where I was there for two, uh, two years for inter-science. And then we had to make a choice. And the choice of chemical engineering happened accidentally. I want to mention that because there are many accidents in one's life, by the way. Okay, because finally it looks like a set plot that you become a great chemical engineer, etc. It was nothing like that. 
because uh, i was uh, born in such a poor family and no i had no advantage of any advice or or, or guide etc etc you know uh, i uh, some or the other had developed a liking uh, for mathematics and physics some or the other i don't mind telling you now that i didn't like chemistry now for a director of national chemical laboratory to openly admit it i think is suicidal but i must say that okay because chemistry was all mugging formulae this that and the other it depends upon who teaches you like when somebody like professor cnr or my guru great guru you know uh, the one of the best chemists in the world teaches you you should see which share magic so uh, probably i didn't have that but i had great teachers in physics and mathematics etc uh, but then what happened so therefore i said i will go to mechanical engineering and then at inter science basically i had uh, stood uh, second among 12000 uh, students and the first was arun dravid my friend okay and then i decided to go to mechanical engineering because i like physics and i like mathematics and vjti uh, you know at matunga was the best institute at that time so on sheer merit because arun dravid opted not to go for mechanical engineering uh he went to chemical engineering i went to mechanical engineering uh it was all said done i got the admission also the results were declared and all that i was right at the top and then one day i was stop, uh, standing at prathana samaj um waiting for a bus and uh, i saw dravid's car passing and dravid uh, saw and stopped me and uh, he said let's have a cup of tea we went and we're sitting i said what are you going to do he said chemical engineering i said what is chemical engineering i had not even heard the name chemical engineering <laughs> then he explained to me because his father was a, a ics officer at that time and so he had a view of uh, the future and uh, uh, accordingly uh, he had sent uh, arun dravid to university university department of chemical technology uh, to meet uh, professor j m nabar who was then the director and he explained to him the whole set up of uh, institute of chemical technology and then i said yo but chemistry he said no no it's all physics maths and he explained to me you know how that is going to i said is that right and then practically it was the last day for uh, for uh, filling forms for ict you know when i look back on that it looks uh, very funny because the, i became the alumnus from there i did my phd there now for last 9 uh, uh, years i have been the chancellor there all that would not happen if they would have not met me at that <laughs> you know bus stop <laughs> and changed my life so I, I, i you have to believe in this serendipity anyway so that's how i went to chemistry and then when i did the became a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering with professor mm sharma probably he's the best chemical engineer india has produced he was very inspiring basically and then uh, what happened was uh, that uh, i was always uh, at the top of the class and um, the tradition in uh, uh, in uh, there was always the top few will go to us and they would get uh, uh, scholarship fellowship etc 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 nobody stayed here those those were the days of uh, times of brain drain uh, you know uh, and uh, but i looked at professor sharma and i wanted to do research that was for sure and i said uh, where can i get a better guru you know why not here all right and uh, he was just barely 27 by the way when he came there and he became a full professor which was also unusual and uh, uh, i i i i had a inspiring journey with him of 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 three years where we did research in mass transfer with uh, chemical reaction now you asked me about the conditions that were there the conditions were very difficult because india was a poor country i'm talking about 1962 i became into science 1966 i became became it all right so i'm talking about 54 years ago when you two were not born okay and india was very poor and uh, we struggled uh, we struggled because uh, we did not have any sophisticated equipment so prof sharma always used to say that it is the power of idea that matters not power of the budget so we had to develop ideas where practically at zero cost we'll be able to do research you know the entire uh, uh, 
sort of uh, a monthly emolument that uh, not emolument the support contingency as we called it for research that will get was 10000 rupees 10000 rupees is uh, nothing you know 130 dollars basically at, 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 at that time at the current rates so within that we had to um, actually do this so no equipment then no access to journals because scientific research is always based on your understanding of what what is happening in the rest of the world okay but the journals would come by sea mail so whatever happened in the rest of the world three or four months earlier we would come to know up to three or four months it is not like uh, you guys now you know you just google and find out a paper and uh, that's it you are you are uh, you are on similarly uh, uh, you know uh, i remember even the phd thesis uh, that i did uh, we used to have a paper then the carbon copy of that then the carbon copy of that so if you have to make four copies uh, you know what you uh, people do today that was not the case at all as a matter of fact you see uh, so uh, equipment wise there was a challenge chemicals wise there was a challenge because there were imported chemicals we not get them then um, i remember in fact in this mass transfer of chemical reaction i worked on what are called as bubble columns where there was a chemical reaction as well as mass transfer going on simultaneously and for those reactions many times we require some solvents and i remember going with a tin uh, to nosil to get sulfolane uh, i remember we used to use perspex columns we did the money to buy those perspex columns so there was one rajpur hoit was professor sharma's friend he had a company and he would give us free perspex columns so it was like uh, begging and borrowing and and somehow the the are uh, doing that research but i'm very proud to say that we did break to research under those conditions with practically uh, sort of zero budget that's why i always say uh, scarcity on one hand and aspiration on the other hand is a deadly combination you know uh, because that leads to innovation and then you learn to so sort of within limited resources you know this is your only strength the ideas is your only strength then we start becoming lazy once we have computers in hand these that etc uh, nowadays if i ask a question on the other day i ask uh, uh, one young fellow about uh, something he said hold on a minute let me google and find out that was not the case at that point in time there was uh, no google this was your google all right yeah so, so some substance of my answer to you are that under very difficult circumstances we are did research that's indeed inspiring for us because now we have everything here like on our laptop that we have open access journals as well so uh, in that time i cannot even imagine how difficult it would be to choose this field and even despite of all these challenges you still uh, pursued the field so my question next is about the same thing that when you had all of these struggles and you had to make a lot of efforts uh and science is always that we have a lot of failures and success is not such a easy thing so how did you keep yourself inspiring did you have peers uh, just like you said about arun dravid or uh, even your mentors who inspired you and who were the people who kept you motivated oh yes uh, i uh, was very lucky as i said professor mm sharma was a great guru and uh, he taught us number of things uh, the first uh, inspiration was uh, that money does not matter mind matters the power of your mind will finally uh, lead to results and that we showed by publishing in international journals winning top honors uh, and so on uh, the second thing uh, he showed to us uh, was uh, you may have shortage of money but you don't have shortage of ideas so every day he would get some new ideas and he would write them on chits you know small chits basically and uh, then he would pass it on to the students so every morning uh, we students will be waiting what ideas he is giving and i remember after the phd was over there was a big pile of chits which i gave back to him because only a few of those ideas uh, we could uh, actually 
uh, sort of uh, use that uh, small institution. The third point is uh, with regard to the failure, that's the correct point that you are raised. I think uh, I always tell young people that interpret fail in a different way. FAIL fail is first attempt in learning. FAIL is first attempt in learning. What does it mean? That your last mistake is your best group. Okay? And you have to learn from that. But if you don't learn from that, then, uh, the, the, you know, uh, life will be difficult. So we, we uh, sort of uh, learn from our mistakes. And idea was not to repeat that mistake again. That's the sum. The third important point, and not necessarily at uh, UDCT, uh, but in my entire life, what we found was that there is what is called a serendipity. Because you get an illusion of a failure, but it's not a failure. There is something great that has happened, but you miss out. You don't see that. Because eyes don't see, mind does not, uh, what mind does not know. And if you look at my uh, research, and you know, in 2019, when I got the Lenovo Science Prize of one lakh dollars uh, uh, in uh, uh, Trieste in Italy by the World Academy of Science. That is the highest prize that they give. And for developing world scientists, it is considered as a kind of a mini Nobel Prize. Of course, it is mini because uh, Nobel Prize is $1 million. This was one lakh dollars, <laughs> but that doesn't matter. It's not the value, but that, that was their highest uh, prize. Now, if you see, the talk that I gave there, the talk that I gave there was on trapeze artistry uh, of uh, uh, the uh, biomimicking um, uh, molecules. And if you see, 80 to 90% of that talk is based on accidental discoveries that we had in life. 80 to 90%. In fact, uh, I have a paper in Current Science which says, Chasing anomalies and discontinuities, uh, the fun and joy of science. What does anomaly mean? Anomaly means something that you are expecting and you find something completely unexpected. Uh, you understand? But what happens is that that unexpected um, observation has happened that doesn't follow in a particular pattern, but maybe there is a signal that there is something new that is happening, and from there, the embedded knowledge you have to extract. Now you, you say, oh, that is too complicated. Explain to us in simple terms. Uh, you guys uh, use these, uh, uh, you know, if you want to send a message, you will put, a, put that uh, um, uh, a little piece of paper, the yellow paper, you know, which sticks in. Uh -huh. Sticky pad, yeah. Yeah, that's correct. Now, that's a half a billion dollar business. It was completely accident because they were trying to do an adhesive and they uh, uh, could not find that uh, adhesive, very poor property. So one of the office assistants started putting that notepad, basically, on a piece of paper while sending the messages. And then somebody said, oh my God, that's a big business. So this was a story of an adhesive that failed. But on the other hand, there is a story of an adhesive that stuck too well. Ismail Kodak, there was some research that was going on. And they found the adhesive was so powerful, they wanted to find the refractive index. All right. So there would be, uh, for, for measuring that, there will be that prism, as you know. And the prism will just stick. It will not just come out. So they got very annoyed and threw it away. Then somebody else saw that. And he found that that particular material can make anything stick to anything. Steel to wood, uh, paper to glass, you know, anything you put two, two uh, together. So that was called super glue. Yes. <laughs> or that became that became half a billion, uh, a billion dollar uh, a business. All right. So notepad on one hand was an accident. Super glue on the other hand, both were unplanned. The third example I'll give you, uh, there was a fellow called, a French fellow called Menstrel. And Menstrel used to walk his dog in the morning and he would have uh, uh, the, the uh, Challenge was, uh, uh, you know, there will be uh, something that will be sticking to the hair of the dog, uh, you know, and it was always a nuisance to clean him up. And then he saw that and he said, my God, these networks that get formed actually, uh, why can't I make a business out of it? 
all right? And like a zipper that we have today, right? You, you people use it, you know, you are um, the cap and all that, etc. And that zipper is a half a billion dollar business today, okay? But it came from nuisance. So it is the way you look at things, basically. So your question was, when you look at failure, how do you sort of uh, look at it? Remember, in every failure, there is a signal. So in um, uh, coming back to my personal, the three examples I will, uh, gave uh, were uh, basically uh, from outside. But let me say from my group, what I found in my own research. For example, uh, I remember uh, I had uh, one fantastic student, Shiny Varghese, a PhD student. And one day uh, she uh, phoned me up because I was in Delhi uh, for 11 years as a director general of CSR. So what I would do is that Friday night I would come to Pune, spend Saturday, Sunday in the lab and go back. So every weekend I did that. And I remember her phoning me up and she says, sir, I found something very funny. So we were working on what are called a gels, like jello you have, right? And they are synthetic gels made of polymer. And the property was that they became super absorbing polymers. That means uh, if I were to take a beaker, put some water and put just uh, five grams, the entire water will be sucked in in those five grams like Agasti Muni, you know, how he yeah. sucked in the entire sea, like that. So these kinds of uh, gels we're working on. So if you have a cylinder of a gel, dry gel, you put it, it becomes bigger cylinder. If you have a sphere of a gel, put it in water, it becomes a bigger sphere, right? What she found was that there was a cylinder that she had put in a particular solution, that cylinder automatically transformed into a sphere. And it was not just a sphere, but it was like a coconut-like structure. And then she could reverse it to make it cylinder. <laughs> you get the point. Now that was a big breakthrough. This is called macroscopic self-organization, you know, at, 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 at that level. And there is a deep science involved with it in which I will not uh, sort of uh, go at the moment. And we published a number of papers. And there was a second uh, accident also that took place. Uh, we had these gel pieces, which were ground to very small pieces. And uh, we were trying to take electron microscope of that. And where the individual pieces are supposed to be individual, right? And she found it was impossible to keep them separate. And uh, then my practice always was that my student will come to the airport, Pune airport. I'll get into the car with them. It takes 45 minutes to come to NCR. And in that, they will be showing me the results. So my um, the work started right from the time I ended. So she showed to me and she was crying, sir, I can't get properly. And then when I looked at it, my God, I said, this is a breakthrough. This is a breakthrough. Why? Because these materials were self-healing. Okay? Like if you have a cut on your finger, what happens? Automatically it heals. Right? So they were showing these healing properties and materials like that had showed never, no, no healing properties. I said, they are sticking together because the interface, you know, they are, they are, uh, uh, they are sticking. <clears throat> and that led to major breakthrough because we are the first ones in the world to show that there are healing polymers of that kind. And later on, we had major paper <clears throat> where we showed even rapid healing. Rapid healing means there's a film where we show that there is a piece of cylinder of a gel and the cylinder of a gel, they come together, all right? And instantly they stick. And then you try to pull them out. You know, one mm -hmm. cylinder, one cylinder becomes a bigger cylinder. They just don't separate. That's the first time in the world that we showed. And that led to many discoveries, including uh, uh, what uh, uh, is the discovery of a new molecule, uh, only which does that. It is called acrylyl 6 amino capric acid. We call it A6A6. And that molecule had such a balance of hydrophobicity and hydrophobicity. Hydrophobicity means water loving and hydrophobicity means water hating. And in the same molecule, you know, these two properties were there. That, that set the world on fire. All around the world, this is being used now for doing different things. Like, uh, uh, you know, in stem cell research, they are using it for cell differentiation uh, in MIT. 
uh, Bob Langer, they're creating these uh, enteric elastic uh, uh, coating, uh, uh, you know, the drug that you take actually. Uh, there are uh, others who are using it in oil wheel drilling because they are spontaneously plugging characteristics as soon as that's etc. And it has set the world on fire in the sense we never imagined that from stem cell to oil wheel drilling uh, to enteric coating uh, to what have you, they would be basically used. So that is the beauty of science. All that would not happen, like if I was not standing at that bus stand, uh, you get my point today, I won't be the chancellor of ICT. Similarly, if uh, that failure was not there, basically, you know, uh, 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 and uh, then this would not happen. But remember how that failure took place. Uh, why why uh, uh, sh uh, the Shiny got that? That also is interesting because you would consider that as a failure because your question is on failure. And I want students to understand uh, the science behind the failure of science. So uh, what happened was that, you know, our conditions were not very good in NCL those days. And uh, there was only one drying woman in, uh, in, in uh, her division, uh, Chinese division. And there used to be a queue of students, all right? Because you can put only so much. So you have to put your number and then you stand in the queue and then you put. So we had one new uh, oval, one old oval. Now she had put those pieces uh, in the old oval. Now they were transparent like water. Following day when she came, uh, they had turned uh, green or pale blue. And not only that, that cylinder had turned into a sphere. So she said, uh, I can't believe my eyes. There is some magic that is happening. And then she again did the experiment. Same thing happened. Then what she did was that uh, maybe something wrong with the oven. So she put it in the new oven. Following day she came, it was exactly the same. So. If you put in an old oven, all right, the transparent turns to blue or green. If you turn into a new oven, it does not. Okay, this you would consider as uh, something funny. But then she stood over there. She's a fantastic girl. She stood over there to see what was happening. So when she was closing the door of the oven, there was some little rust because it was a rusted one that was falling. That is iron. Oh. Okay, so that is metallic iron. And we there discovered the metal ion complexation phenomena for healing as well as the rest of the phenomena that we are talking about. So all that I've said during the last 10 minutes, just to tell the students, the science is a lot of fun and there is nothing like failure in science. In every failed experiment, there is some message for you. There is some breakthrough for you. Don't forget that penicillin was an accident. Yeah. Don't forget that there are six Nobel prizes including PCR. Today, you have the vaccine. Vaccine wouldn't be there if mRNA was not there. That's science. That would not have there if genome sequencing was not there. That would not have been there if PCR, polymeric chain reaction, would not have been there. And PCR itself was an accidental breakthrough, by the way, which got the big. So today, without that accidental breakthrough, we would not be having vaccine. Can you just uh, imagine that? That's the beauty of science.